Welcome, it's Andrew Eborn here, and great to see you for another Lives on Lockdown, where my very special guest is my wonderful chum, Toya. How are you, Toya? I'm so relieved to see you, Andrew. So relieved. I'm really good, thank you. And I'll tell you what, I'm so relieved to see you as well, because I was hoping to see you live in just a, a couple of weeks ago with Hazel as well, and you're going to be performing in Islington and many other places. It's, um, it's been extraordinary. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. Yeah, um, what's actually. happening at the moment is that we're trying to find ways, as you know, talking to Harvey Goldsmith, of making venues safe. So the next show I've got coming up, which hasn't been announced, is a drive-in festival. Oh, brilliant. In a huge airport car park. Right. Where it, I just don't know how it's going to work because they expect the audience to stay in the cars and speakers will be delivered to the cars. Well, can you imagine what that's going to be like in the summer? So I, I just don't know how we're going to move forward at the moment. But you know, I know, the promoters know, we're going to do anything to make it happen as long as people are safe. Yeah, I, I think you're absolutely right. And, and people have been speaking to me about um, doing similar drive-in movies, which is the classic way of doing it. So you, you are self-contained, albeit yeah. you're, you're with your loved one quite close, and then they can deliver stuff to you as well. And I've been talking about doing holograms with that as well, all the sort of interesting things. But you are, without doubt, one of my favourite people in entertainment, goes without saying, but also you're also one of the busiest. And, and you're saying, oh, you do your movies, you do your concerts, you do your books, your TV. How on earth have you been coping in lockdown? Oh, well, this year was going to be the pinnacle of my career. Uh, and it still in many ways is. Uh, I think lockdown has been both terrifying, frustrating and quite wonderful in a very strange way for creative people because this time last year i was so busy i was on five movies and touring and i was thinking what would it be like to take a year off where i could sit down and write a new album write the book i've always intended to write uh, and i thought no i can't do that I i'm 62 years old you can't take a break at my age and suddenly this break was enforced on us and it's been a very creative time uh, i've still got every one of my albums is being re-released -re uh, within the next 12 months so my success this year started along with my failures which was not being able to play live um the release of toya solo the box set uh, brilliant which, box set beautifully produced isn't it isn't it gorgeous? Went straight into the charts. Um, Toya and the Humans, which is really obscure. It's my Seattle band. That's a box set uh, called Noise in Your Head out on the 3rd of July. Already practically sold out and they've had to go to reprint. And that's on pre-orders. And then from September onwards, all the first of my albums, um, all the Safari catalogue is going to be re-released. So my presence has been very good. And another thing I did, Andrew, that I've always never understood, um, and I think part of it is a dyslexic, is I see in images, I see in 3D, I don't see in a flat screen. Um, but I started in lockdown to take social media really seriously. And my goodness, has that really taken off? Yeah. Um, I have a wonderful social manager called Craig Astley and a wonderful archivist who archives everything I do um, on Toyanet as well. And I just, I've reached an international audience for the first time in my career via social media. So the lockdown for me has been how to get through the maze the maze of frustration, the maze of um, not knowing who and what you're supposed to be, but, and also treading very carefully because I do have a privileged life. I have a garden. Oh, I, I have know, I've, I've seen the videos, they're, they're fantastic, I love it. Well, I mean, how do you put that into the outside world without looking, firstly, oh, woe is me, because there is no woe is me. I've been yeah. locked up for three months because my husband is 74. We're safe. Um, but, you know, how do you share that with people? And I've done that, I think, through humour and observation.
Yeah, and I think human observation, I mean, I've been talking, as, as you know, to, to people around the world. So I, I was doing some comedy in Cairo. I was talking to some people in <laughs> LA about the extraordinary situation going on there. Yeah. Um, and we spoke to people in New Zealand and people, uh, you know, many, many different places are approaching it in so many different ways, aren't they? And that's the confusing thing about this. I mean, it's a, from an artist's point of view, it's crazy because you're locked down. And, and I think people are either reinventing themselves or they're getting really, really lost on that sort of stuff. You have, as always, sort of embraced the situation. Your social media videos that you're posting are just brilliant. I love them. I really enjoy doing them. And they started because I needed to get my husband, Robert Fripp, engaged with life again. Right. Uh, there's this phenomenon that I think has been growing where people over 70 are a bit scared of life. Um, my husband was supposed to be on a world tour and I've just seen him shut himself away in a room. Admittedly, he's writing a book, but I needed him to engage with life. So I started the films, especially the ballets, um, which he's had huge stick for. Brilliant. Because he, you know, intellectual Robert Fripp, King yeah. Crimson. My God, has he had stick for that. Uh, but it was a way of breaking down those barriers that were being inflicted on him um, and getting him engaged with life again and engaged with my life. So I've got huge respect for social media, but also the lockdown has allowed me to reset. And what I mean by that is last year, I was doing jobs where the attitude is you're an artist you will do anything because you are an artist and what i mean by that is you turn up at venues very few venues treated me like this i mean out of the 150 shows i do two venues would not have backstage loos or dressing rooms right. how can someone of my caliber not have a dressing room Absolutely. you can't sit at the bar no. so um i've got rid of all of that from my diary. Um, I've actually blocked people on my phone for the right. first time in 35 years um, because they just do not listen to what you need as a human being. And the lockdown gave me the strength to do that. Yeah, and, and I think you're right. I mean, it, it has been that sort of clearing out, if you like. We've refocused, haven't we? And I think as individuals, you can turn and say, look, this is what's important. Dealing with people oh, that you Andrew, like and, and you can trust. Andrew, yeah. you've frozen. Can you hear oh, me? Have I frozen? Oh, I can still see you. Are you okay? Have you frozen? Well, Andrew, I'm going to rejoin. Uh, so, welcome back. There you go. My special guest today is the wonderful Toya. And just before the break, Toya, you were telling us that the most important thing about this time is how to get rid of people and the people who no longer matter in your life. And all of a sudden, you hung up on me and you disappeared. <laughs> how does that make me feel? I'm so sorry about that. I, whenever I do a broadcast, Andrew, I live near Worcester. Right. And they start digging up the roadworks outside my office and disconnecting everything. And I, I just don't know what happened then. So sorry. No, I, I, I could take the subtle hint, you know. I could take the subtle hint. It's going to be good. What we were also saying is just how creative in this extraordinary time that you're starting to do social media again. You're working with these fantastic videos, which I love, with Robert doing the ballet. I mean, King Crimson, he, he's one of my favorite people as well in, in, in the way that he deals with people, because he's got such a beautiful, dry sense of humor. And the way that you managed to bring him out on that sort of thing is superb. I love it, absolutely love it. He, he's potentially a wonderful actor. Oh, there you go, that, that would be interesting. Are you gonna bring him into something? Um, I, well, I don't think I've got that power and I don't think he has the discipline. Um, but he, if they ever made 10 Rillington Place again, oh, yes. he'd, he'd be perfect. He's got that kind of edge in what he does. As you say, it's very dry and it's beautifully subtle. <laughs> no, but, it, but it's, it's hilarious. I mean, sitting with the two of you, when, when all the fans come in, <laughs> coming up and he'll say, keep walking or whatever you know he, he's so brilliant in that sort of stuff i love it it's uh... uh well i'm i'm not like that i i'm uh, my husband um you just don't cross his path uh, he is so clever very good with words um a few journalists in italy had a go at him for doing ballet and uh my goodness did he go in for the attack um i just you know, my husband is not someone to challenge because he'll get it back tenfold through intellectual, his intellectual power rather than anything else. Yeah. And he is, he's kind of person. brilliant, a fantastic mind. And, and the great thing is he's collaborated with some of the, the best in, in history and things like that as well, hasn't he? 
Yeah, of course. Yeah. I mean, he produced um, the first Peter Gabriel solo album. He, he's worked with Bowie. So he, he's really worked with a lot of very brilliant people. And he's been married to me for 34 years. I, and I have so, to say, of, I, I know lots of show, showbiz relationships. And yours, I mean, th that length of time, what, what's the secret then? This will, this will be your loose woman moment. What, what, are, the, what are the secrets of, of such a long, successful relationship? I have a lot of patience. <laughs> and a lot of tolerance. I, I think partly we both have our own careers. Uh, we're not reliant on each other in any way, and that's yeah. by choice. We don't even share a bank account. We do have separate homes, even though for the last 20 years, we've lived mainly in one home. Um, we have a lot of choice, uh, so we choose to be together. And I have an art studio a mile away where I go and paint and do my writing. And that, that's kind of a no-go zone for everyone else. And not many husbands can tolerate that. Right. But I, I need that solitude when I'm working. And I, I absolutely despise being in the kitchen. <laughs> and in lockdown, I wanted my husband to eat well. We became, well, he's always vegetarian, but he does eat fish now and then. But in lockdown, we became 100% vegetarian. Oh, well, so well. I wanted him to eat really well. And I was spending two hours a day cooking really amazing, nutritious food for him. And I've always associated being in the kitchen with being out of work. <laughs> okay. I mean, that's the actress in me. Yeah, yeah. So after three weeks, I was thinking, I can't tolerate this anymore so I started going to my studio and painting and and just getting it out of my system so uh, you ask how it works a 34 year old marriage and I think it's you need your own life yeah and and, and it's respect because you're, you're both such talents in your own right and you, and you complement each other beautifully and I, I think coming coming back what, what I love is that you can come away from the madness and it is madness out there sometimes you come back and you've just got each other and it's superb isn't it yes it, it's it, that's you've you've captured it exactly that we don't have children we well, have a bunny rabbit or used to have a bunny rabbit still, do you still have it well, I, I, I lost my bunny rabbit um three years ago and if anyone out there has a, a white albino buck with a, upright ears preferably um a zili which is a new zealand one yeah i am desperate desperate for a new little bunny rabbit in my life he i miss him so much but we cannot get the pink-eyed rabbits well, so anyway that's an appeal from me uh, but I'll, t I'll tell you what as a as a belated birthday present because that's the other thing you did on on lockdown 18th of may was your birthday if i remember rightly yes and, uh, there you go i remember i i will make sure that we find you because i grew up with lots of animals grew up with horses and rabbits and dogs and all that sort of stuff we yeah. will find you a replacement for that one but because the, the pictures of you, you it was it's it's your child together isn't it that you, you well, got on so well with them you know, we don't have children, but any animal that comes into this house is overloved. So um, Robert believed that he didn't have that side of him. I, I knew I always had that side of me. I think animals ground us. Yeah. So as soon as I, I went against his word and brought this tiny little three, I think he was three months old, Willie Fred, when we got him 10 years ago. Right. And as soon as he came into the house, my husband softened. So that, that really helped. But uh, we are very good together. But the one thing about my husband answering your original question is that he is too insular for his own good. And he has a very dedicated life of just practicing as much guitar a day as possible and it's repetition now I as an artist don't believe in repetition I believe in building originality along with technique but if you only have repetition you are losing part of yourself so I think where Robert and I work together really well is I kind of suppress the repetition that he needs as being a slightly on the spectrum adult and I would say both of us are on a slight adult spectrum of um, adult autism, but it's only slide. Mm -hmm. And he can see where I'm broken and I can see where he's broken. And we really communicate about that. And I think that's why our relationship is possibly the only relationship either of us could ever ha have had. Does that make sense? Oh, no, it, it totally makes sense. And I, I think, I mean, what's really weird, Toya, is that 
all of a sudden we, we become obsessed in society about labels. I and mean, the reality is, and it's like dyslexia and, and, and autism and so on. We've all got challenges. It's okay yeah. not to be okay. And I yeah. think that sort of principle where people are starting to talk about things in a refreshing way, it's encouraging yeah. others to come forward. Well, I think when, uh, with me, I was always utterly niggled by the fact that I could actually get in a car and disappear from the world for days on end. And this started when I was a teenager. I'd run away from home and just disappear. And it's it haunted me as to why that means so much to me and does so much positive good to me. And it is, I think I spent 14 years at an all-girls school and I didn't really enjoy it at all. And as long as I know I can just go and I have the freedom to go, I'm, a, I'm okay. I'm an okay person. But I live for my work. I, I'm the only thing, you know, I don't have holidays. I don't go to beauty spas. I don't really go shopping. Uh, it's, I live to work. And when I'm on a film set and I'm with that creative team of people and I'm one of the vital links in that chain, I am a whole person. Yeah, and I, it's, I've seen that, yeah. And, yeah, and, and what, what's interesting as well, Tori, is that um, even when you've got those extraordinary situations and, and you've been different and, and it's great to be different because you stand out. But at yeah. boarding school, for example, well, when you went to the all-girls school, it was quite tough, wasn't it? I mean, there was bullying involved and everything, but you became, it brought out, you were a rebellious teenager, I think you, you previously admitted oh, to. I, yeah, I was pretty awful. I, I had two teachers that recognised that I just shouldn't have been at that school, right. and I should have been in a drama school. So the one way they controlled my energy, and my energy is off the scale. I mean, even at 62, it's off the scale. Amazing. You and so, me both, I love it. When we get together, we're sort of, ah! <laughs> <laughs> so I had an art teacher called Karen Howell, who used to find me in the corridors when I'd been thrown out of class, mainly maths class or geography <laughs> or history. And she'd bring me straight into the art room and I'd start designing the school posters oh, for the wow. end of year plays. And then I'd design the programs and then I'd start designing the sets and then I'd design the, how it, the play was going to be directed. And there was another teacher called um, Shirley Williams who realized I could write poetry. So she would just give me a pen and a pencil and, and paper and say, just go away, write poetry while you're in detention. And that's where the song I Want to Be Free came from. Right. That lyric was written while I was in detention at the age of 14. So I had two teachers at school who realized that everything in my life is based on visuals. And they allowed me to develop that in a school that really was preparing its girls for um, higher education, for university. And I just couldn't wait to get out of the educational system. And as soon as I got out, I spent a year in drama school at Birmingham where I got spotted by two directors because I was literally the only punk rocker in the village at this time. <laughs> and after a series of magical events, I ended up at the age of 18 at the National Theatre. And those people embraced me. They absolutely embraced me. They gave me speech lessons to improve my lisp. I had movement lessons. I met musicians. I put my first band together. I met Derek Jarman, the filmmaker. There was no looking back. I suddenly fitted in with other creatives. And, and what happened, as you say, it was a, a lot of a chance, if you like. You, you turn around, you meet one lot of creatives. They then introduce you. Oh, you must come along and meet Derek. And you, you go around famously to his, his house on Tregunta Road and you have your cup of tea with him and you sit there and, and, and Adam it, really, it, it shines. I, I had a language with me on that occasion. <laughs> <laughs> but, but it is important. But even in your school days, you, you, you were wonderfully mischievous, as well from being creative and it's, it's great to hear the history of I, I, want, I, I want to be free and that sort of stuff. But tell me the story, I do know it, about Maggie Thatcher when she came to visit you at your school. Well, I was very disruptive at school. I did anything to disrupt the system. So I was disruptive in class, and I, if I knew how to make explosives, I would have blown the school up. Um, I, I, we, it was announced at one school assembly that the Minister of Education was going to come and give a talk to parents and teachers and pupils alike. And the Minister of Education, I think this was 1972, was Margaret Thatcher. So none of us really knew that she was you're going to become what and who she was to become 
And I just thought, you know, this is a really, really good opportunity to really disrupt the whole day. So I got into the school early. The school opened at about 10 to 9. And um, I got to there about 8 in the morning. And already the security were there with the sniffer dogs looking for explosives because we had had bombings um, very close to the school. This was during the Birmingham pub bo bombings. And there was a news agency across the road where a soldier sadly was killed while dismantling a bomb. And just going back to that exact time, I was sitting in the window at a mass class at the front of the school and the bomb went off 40 yards away and we weren't evacuated. So even though we saw the bomb go off and the glass in this Edwardian school, this old glass, I saw it convex in over our heads. It didn't break, but everything convexed in. And we were in a bombing. So this is what that time was like. So when Margaret Thatcher came to the school, um, the school was highly politicized by this. And there were MPs' daughters at the school. It was a really top school. Oh, I know, I know. Yeah. yeah. So I got in early with five alarm clocks and I set them under the school stage to go off from 3 p.m. onwards, which was when Margaret was due to speak. And the, the school day was normal till about two o'clock. Then we were all ushered into the big assembly hall and there were talks and then Margaret Thatcher came on at three and the alarm clocks went off on time. And there was five of them. So they were going off at two minute intervals. So Margaret Thatcher completely ignored them, but everyone knew the only person in the school that would have done this was me. Right. And, you know, I just had a lot of people looking at me and I, I was in my usual trouble, I threatened to be expelled and all of that. Um, but the, the weirdest thing about that was this was 72. By 1979, my management office was on Flood Street in Chelsea right. and our next door neighbour was Margaret Thatcher. Oh, how funny. Did, did you go and ring on her doorbell and play, play ginger or something? That's no, because there were two men with guns outside her door 24 hours a day. Oh, funny. But, but actually, Maggie, I mean, Margaret Thatcher had a great sense of humour as well. This, this is what I love. There's some, something about it's like people like Bernie Ecclestone in, in, in that sort of stuff. People who have a certain amount of power. Harvey, who I was speaking to earlier, they, they, yeah. they all have a graph exterior because they need to be. That's the sort of nature of the industry. But they've got this wonderful sort of wicked sense of humour. And I, I think it's that... To me, that, that's what really appeals. And Robert's the same, you're all the same, and that sort of stuff. You've got, you've got to do this persona, you've got to do this act for everybody. But at the same time, there's that one more sort of wicked, if you like, mischievousness about it. Oh, yeah, I think mischief is, a, is part of the magical ingredient of life. Uh, I, I love the absurd and I love British humour. Um, and I think people that you've been talking about, who the people that really stick their hands in the mess of life yeah. to keep things going. You know, they have to have that, I think, to stay sane. I'm an artist. I'm allowed to be vulnerable. I have to be vulnerable. I'm allowed to have weak moments. They're, they're all part of my expression. But people who lead us and people who um, put Live Aid on, I think, you know, you're talking about a different sense of humour because they have, they just can't lose their bottle. Yeah. Um, I, I, oh, they, they do lose their like, <laughs> lose their right, some but, the people but, you talk to. Yeah, sometimes you know, it, it's an act just to get things done because it is about that sort of side. Um, yeah. And what, what's interesting, because a lot of these times, sometimes when you're very tough on the outside, it's because you've had a lot of trauma on the inside. And growing up, I know it, it, it was tough. You had quite a strict upbringing by um, your own sort of recollection. Do you think the creative side came as a result of that sort of adversity? Yes, the creative side came out because I think I was born creative. Um, my mother was a professional dancer. Lanagan and, and Allen, no less. Yes, yes. And um, she went to ballet school from the age of, I think, 11. And by the time she was 12, she was already touring in vaudeville and getting re really good reviews. And she used to open for Max Wall. Right, she was in the dance troupe, and she was married and having her first child by 19. So I inherited that gene from her, that kind of, you know, the showbiz, the show must go on gene. But 
I, I was always the brunt of everyone's jokes at home and at school. And partly that was my physicality because um, I, was, I had twisted spine. Um, one leg was two inches longer than the other. I'm not, I wasn't aware of any of this. I was a tomboy and I, I was very, very athletic. I did ballet, I did gym, I did acrobatics. I was always breaking my teeth, breaking my bones. I was fearless. But I didn't realize that part of the reason people just found me so unbelievably funny was my physicality, um, the lisp and all of that. And it wasn't really till I joined the National Theatre, I realized the extent of the cruelty of how people found me funny. And I think my drive in the very beginning, from the age of 14 upwards, my drive was just simply to prove people wrong. Uh, now I'm just totally in love with the industry. I, I, I love what I do. I love other people's successes, other people's talents. Um, I, I just dribble over the talent of J.J. Abrahams. You, you know, you just look at other people and you think, oh my goodness. And I'm one of these person that looks at someone else's success and I think there it's our success as well. What, uh, what other people achieve instantly becomes available to us. So I, I just love the industry. Yeah. And, and you've always had that can-do attitude. Right? And I think, as you say, it's been a, a combination of that drive, if you like, where you've had those tough times and growing up and, and that's how but you rebel and you can show that creativity. But also it's been opportunities, hasn't it? And people have oh, taken incredible. you under their wing and, and taken an instant shine to you. And the list of names of people you've worked with, like Catherine Hepburn, who yes. first saw you were sort of far in your eyes, you know? I mean, you're yes. absolutely good. Tell us about that. Well, I was a, a serious punk rocker. This was about 1978, and I'd only done, I think, one movie up till that point, and that was Derek Jarman's Jubilee. And um, I, I had a wonderful, wonderful agent called Libby Glenn. She was American, based on Arlington Street in the West End, and oh, she was the best thing that happened in my life she was so dedicated and her, her mantra to me was Toya could you just look normal because I had <laughs> bright pink hair and I was three stone heavier than I am now and and she said she phoned up one day and she said Toya you tomorrow you're going for an audition at Eaton Place and you're going to meet George Cukor who's a film director and you're going to meet Catherine Hepburn who is a Hollywood actress please, could you look normal? So I went to the National Theatre and I borrowed my brown wig from a play called Tales from the Vienna Woods, uh, adapted by Christopher Hamilton. And I went along to Eaton Square with this lovely long brown wig on. And I'm very small. You know, I'm, I'm barely five foot tall. So I can easily pass back then for a 13 year old. And I met George Cukor. He opened the door no idea who he was he was just a lovely lovely elderly american gentleman and he walked me into the living room where Catherine hepburn was and i thought oh what a lovely lovely lady did you know who she was at that stage i know you would have done no no who did look <laughs> well i vaguely you know i'd seen her right with harry grant yes okay. but you know the arrogance of youth yeah yeah you know, I was just thinking about me. I was thinking about, I want a record contract. I want to be in Star Wars. You know, I, I want, I want, I want. Yeah, yeah. So I did vaguely recognize her, but I was, you know, Not worshiping me. Um, so anyway, I, we did a reading. It was Emlyn Williams, The Corn is Green, being made into a TV movie produced by both Cukor and Hepburn. Right. And then we got on to punk. <laughs> and, Catherine was just so enamoured at the concept of punk right. and I was telling her about the band and what we had to tolerate. Yeah. You know, people spat at us and people thought that we were kind of aggressive and nasty when really punks, I think, were very progressive yeah. in that we were very accepting and just wanted the world to change for the better. So I went away from that just thinking I'd had a lovely afternoon with two wonderful American people. And at midnight, I got a call from Libby Glenn and she was 
just you could tell she was beside herself with joy and she said toy you've got the role of bessie watty go back the next day and read the whole play with Catherine hepburn yeah. so by this time i'd taken my wig back to the national theater it was worth about three thousand pounds so i couldn't keep hold of it right. and I, I went back to eaton square and george cukor opened the door to me and my bright red hair and he said do you want to take your hat off and i said no george this is my hair and he was visibly upset and what was really interesting about this, in retrospect, George Cukor had a reputation for being really tough with his actresses. Right. He had a reputation for shouting. And he only ever did that to me once, and that was on set. And Catherine Hepburn really, really tore him down a strip. And Cukor got a fabulous performance out of me. And what I would say to him at this point, when he opened that door, right. is he did not lose his temper with me. And I think what he saw in me was what was necessary for women in the industry to remain strong and protected. So he led me into uh, where Catherine Hepburn was. <laughs> he said, Catherine, can you believe this hair is bright red? You know, kind of steam coming out of his ears. And Catherine got up and she, George, this is just so wonderful. If only I could have done it when I was her age. <laughs> And, I, you know, I think these were two people yeah. who had to play a very dangerous game within the Hollywood system because they were genuine artists. They weren't like the roots of Hollywood, which really did start in the porn industry and how men could sleep with more women. These were two genuine performers who loved the art of film, who believed in performance passionately because Catherine Hepburn on her first stage performance the critics called her manly vulgar ugly should never be seen live again and um her voice should never be heard it was like nails down a blackboard you know these people had received um the sharp end of the stick as it were of of criticism and I think when they met me what they really took to was that the rebellion I had is the rebellion it took to be in that industry. Does that make sense? Well, no, it, it totally makes sense. And, and I think this is what, what, what I find is that it's such an artificial industry. And there's so many people who are terribly shallow and they have to live a persona, which is not really there. So they go home. And the reason a lot of people in this profession get depressed and, uh, and we don't see the real side of them is that they are not allowed to be themselves. And what yeah. you have done, and Catherine and various others have done, is say, actually, we're human. If you trick me, do I not bleed? If you trick me, do I not laugh? All that sort of stuff. And the industry, when it's so horrible, even, even when you were getting your grant to go to school, they would sort of say, oh, don't give it to her, don't give her the grant because she's got a lisp and is unattractive. You know, and you yes. become, you then become <laughs> voted the most sexiest person ever. <laughs> You know, and you beat Kim Wilde that year in 1981, I remember. But yeah. That's what happens if you can get rid of the artificiality of the industry and be yourself. I think this is why people take a real shine to you. It, it's a tough one. The grant you're referring to, I mean, it was a heartbreaking moment. Oh, of course it was. No money. I was, I think, about 16 turning 17, and I auditioned for a grant for drama school and I, with a Mr. Slade, and um, I saw his notes. She's unattractive. She has a list she can't walk and i didn't get the grant and i was penniless but what that led to and talk about angels in the architecture yeah. um my, the head of the drama school uh, uh mary richards who worked for a very famous um theater man who worked with Lawrence olivier Barry Evans or, or someone like that, Mary Richards realized I couldn't even buy a slice of bread. So she let me go to the drama school for free. Oh, she did? Oh, oh good. Okay. Oh, yeah. I, I paid her back once I was at the National. Yeah. And I then started dressing. I was a dresser backstage at the Birmingham Alexander Theatre, at the Hippodrome Theatre, dressed Judy Geeson, Sylvia Sims, right. Simon Williams, the whole of Dad's Army many, many more, and they all realised I was penniless, and they all fed me. Yeah. Isn't that wonderful? You know, there, there are beautiful people in this industry, beautiful people. So when you say, you know, find your naturalness, the way I would interpret that, Andrew, is find your uniqueness. Yeah. 
Yeah. And what fascinates me about social media is the, the biggest success that is making BBC, Channel 4, Channel 5 employ the social media stars is those stars are basically talking about normality. Absolutely. And I find that quite surprising because I always try and turn normality on its head. It, it's never attractive to me. Um, but people need recognition in their homes of themselves. Mm -hmm. So I think the price I've slightly paid is that I've admitted that I'm a bit strange. But, but, but I think being strange is great, you know? And, and I think this is, that the reason things like soaps work, the reason reality show work, is because you're, you're, people, first of all, are very nosy. They like to see other people's lives. Yeah. But they also, we're now cutting through the fake. The, what I love about this medium is that I can sit down with people who've been chums for years and just talk about real stuff. So it's not like you're, we've got 30 seconds to promote our book. That's what we're going to do. Yeah. Da -da -da, off you go. It's yeah. actually, let's, let's be real about it. We have good times. We have wonderful times and sometimes really really bad times but <laughs> Andrew you once booked me for a show where my band was stuck on the Dartford Bridge oh, I and I was you on stage in three minutes oh it was glorious and talk about bad times I have never bricked it as much in my life and uh, th there was an accident on on the Dartford Bridge and uh, and they literally turned up i think the moment i was announced oh it was and i was announcing i was presenting as well i, <laughs> <laughs> I, th I think i had to run through your whole history first I thought, I mean, how I, many people are in that there was eight thousand people in I was massive. it was a massive race course they loved it <laughs> Well, that's oh, great because we had Rick Astley on the bill as well and we had paul young uh, yeah. and, 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 and you you were it was fantastic but it's good because that means that actually we're living in the moment. And I actually like those moments because we're not just regurgitating stuff. And, and what I notice is a lot of people in this industry, it really is just giving them permission. It's okay not to be on all the time. It's okay to have a terrible day in this sort of moment. And I think the more we can encourage people to do that in this fake media age, the better, isn't it? Yeah, and I think men in particular, I, I've done a lot of work in the last six months with the charity Calm. Yeah. which is to actively discourage men from thoughts of suicide and the act of suicide. And in lockdown, I it, it's the one thing that has really struck me is I'm a woman. I'm used to being disempowered. It doesn't make it right, but I'm used to it and I ride the wave of it. But to see men who are have been in the last two months used to phenomenal success running successful companies going to zero and that's that's frightened me that that they've been put through that uh, and I, I feel very strongly that part of my work is to empower people and to empower people that don't get a look in uh, and what has really resonated with me very strongly in the last six months is men suffer uh, and we know women suffer it's there in history it, it's it's been broadcast a lot but i think in the modern world as you know kind of women come forward and stuff like that we do tend to forget that men are equally vulnerable uh, and in the last couple of weeks i've just been seeing men lose their fight uh, and that frightens me and, and i will do anything i can to motivate and give confidence back to people who've suffered that yeah. And, and I, I, I've set up something called Canned Laughter, which, as, as you know, yes. I'm involved with, with equity and I'm involved with the magic circle, involved with lots of the creative industries. I've set up something called Canned Laughter, and, and the reason came out, it's okay not to be okay, it's sort of praise yeah. people at the time. And the reason we did that was for exactly the reason you said, is that people think you have to have this persona in the big outside world, and you're not allowed to show the weaknesses, and you're not allowed to show your failure, not allowed to do that sort of stuff. And the more that we get people coming on and talking about their own struggles, the more it empowers people to say, it is okay not to be okay. I'm not alone in the darkest moments when the most ebullient characters are often the ones who are tortured inside. And you find yeah. that a lot with comedy and everything else, don't you? I know. I believe comedy and observational comedy, I think, is brilliant. And especially on a day like today with, with America doing what it's doing. It's, you know, that what can you say when, when people are, are just being treated that way by a leader? It's just crazy. But 
comedy I think is brilliant but also the act of talking and I, I'm not great at reaching out to people I, I'm quite good on my own uh, and what I've done in the past few weeks is reached out to people I don't normally reach reach out to and say just hello I'm here mm -hmm. and it's been remarkable because firstly they're surprised to hear from me uh, and secondly they've needed to talk and I think talking is a great great help and having friends is a great help and no one i just you should expect to be perfect perfection is not possible moving forward growing um strengthening what you know is possible but being perfect no what does it mean no one is perfect no one should be that there's a very simple set of exercises I started a month ago that did me the world of good and it's based on the theory of the secret and there's a book out there called the magic top bestseller you know there's nothing revelatory about this but it works and every morning you wake up and you write down 10 blessings in your life like I am blessed for these glasses because someone made them someone invented the lenses someone got the plastic someone delivered them and in these blessings you just remember the chain that follows each blessing I am blessed from this lipstick so some bees made the wax, someone made the dye, someone designed the packaging, someone put it in the shop, someone delivered it, and someone paid me the money to buy it. And you start joining up the pieces. And I did this every morning um, for a whole month. And boy, it did me the world of good because it stopped it being about me. And I just think if you look around you and see the good things, before you see the bad things, you get a different perspective. So even when I'm really ratty and miffed with how I'm treated, I always try and see the good outcome of it and go from that perspective and it makes it a much more palatable thing to deal with. Does that make sense? Oh, no, it totally makes sense. And that's how I sort of live, live by that as well. I think you can recognize that sort of stuff, because there's so much to be grateful for. We are incredibly privileged in what we're doing. And even those in, in the darkest moments, there's some great things to look at. And it's a question trying to put the world in perspective, isn't it? Because I think you're right. And the, the reason, as I say, a lot of people have troubles is because they have to live a lie. They get packaged and there's so many expectations on you. And they sort of yeah. turn around and say, OK, hang on, there's, there's some good in all of this. Can I change the perspective of how I look on the world? Yeah. And the more we can get people to talk about it, and you often find this, and when, again, with celebrities, you're the biggest A-stars in the world. One person will say, I met them on such and such a day. They were wonderful, the best person ever. The other person, oh, no, I met them. They were a real grump. I said, well, <laughs> probably the answer is both. Because yeah. you yeah. speak to me at different times of the day. I'll be grumpy at one moment. I'll be happy at the other. Um, yeah. it's just, and if you went up to them in a restaurant when they're trying to have a private dinner, that's probably not the moment. So you try to work out that people in the public eye are people and they've got feelings as well, haven't they? Well, also, uh, the way I look at it is there's different levels of craft within different levels of successful people. So let's take Charlize Theron. Um, I think she's about six foot three, so that gives her presence in the room as well as her Same natural. Same size as me, yeah, yeah. Okay. She produces films. She's phenomenally successful. She chooses the right scripts. She develops the right scripts. So there's a power player. Then on screen, her technique is so phenomenal on screen that she can blow any other actress away. Bombshell is an absolute example of this. Um, there's a she's working with English and American actors on that film and because I think American actors have such phenomenal technique and they even the A-listers still go to acting class what you see on the big screen is the perfection of technique you're not seeing the person you're not seeing the reality of the actor you're seeing their phenomenal technique which is an art form so if you go up to them in a restaurant when they're being them you're not meeting the same person and i just tell myself that i tell myself that absolutely no one in this world knows who i am so don't approach them as if they should and that for me puts everything in perspective um i firstly i never approach famous people i i i, I I'm too enamored to do that. But also, I know the pressure they're under to do exactly what you're saying and be up to 
10 all the time rather than allowing themselves to be running on four. Uh, it, it's a really difficult one. I, I live on a high street in a very small market town just on the edge of the Cotswolds. And I know if people come up to me, they've come up to me because they trust me as well as know me. So I'm always really kind and I stop whatever I'm doing and I say, how are you? How's your family? How's everyone coping? Because that's the environment I live in. That would not happen in Hollywood. You, it can't happen in Hollywood because people are chased with cameras and they're chased by people trying to fall over in front of them and sue them. It, in this country, that doesn't happen. So I think you have to look at the reality of the situation you're in uh, and think about, well, why is this celebrity in that surrounding at this present time? Yeah, and I, I think you're absolutely right on that. And, and I think, again, it's, it's such a, a strange industry where people are manufactured. I mean, you obviously massive star in, in the 80s and that sort of stuff, but the pressure's on you to be a certain person, to be a product, if you like, sort of yeah. can, for some people in that era, they certainly personally start to believe the, the, the own publicity, which is the worst thing you should ever do. But also the people surrounding them on the way up disappear on the way down. And a lot of those people then get terribly worried and have all okay. sorts of issues. There's a lot of questions here to be answered. Um, firstly, I am fascinated by people who are completely lost in their own world and they have no idea of the vulnerability of the House of Cards. I just love watching those people, um, mainly the reality stars who, who believe they're mega stars. Um, it, it's absolutely astounding. And they're the ones that treat you the worst. And I've obviously I've done a few reality programs and the ones I'm that- I'm a celebrity, believe, you've done this, you've done, I mean, phenomenal. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The, the ones who believe that they are mega stars and have absolutely no <laughs> natural talent, yes. they're the worst. They are absolute the worst and they are most fascinating to work with. You're not allowed to talk to them. You can only listen to them. Um, everyone around them, they've obviously um, developed contracts that are so rock solid that they have to be treated like A-listers. And you think, wow, <laughs> what are you going to do when that house of card falls? Mm. Uh, and then I have to add the greatest human beings I've met are the A-listers. Absolutely. Absolutely. I have not met an idiot A-lister. The bigger the name, the greater the soul. Paul McCartney, Catherine Hepburn, Kate Bush, they are really stunning human beings. Mm. Sting, wonderful human beings. Peter Gabriel, they're not idiots and they don't treat people badly. So that whole thing is, I actually think there is something out there as an A-list superstar and they're great human beings. So for those who fall from grace or who had superstardom and don't have it so much now, you're right. That is really hard. And I think some protect themselves by living in an imaginary bubble. But I think others just get on with it and develop their craft. And if I'm to name names, I'm going to insinuate that they've kind of had a fall. And see, I don't believe in the fall uh, because you never lose your talent. But let's look at the trajectory of Jason Donovan, who was the, hounded by the press, hounded by the news of the world. I mean, what you very rarely hear about Jason, he's a fabulous father in a fabulous marriage. He's a wonderful- Lovely guy, lovely guy. Wonderful family man, super successful um, touring artist and West End artist and a great actor. People don't want to know the good news about people like us in the newspapers. They want tragedy, they want jeopardy. So uh, there are a few that fall from gay grace and go, to alcohol, possibly go to drugs, but there are also a hell of a lot of survivors yeah. who mature into very brilliant stars and they, they face their demons. And, and I think the, the real secret, and you're right about a list I think the more successful people are, the more comfortable they are in being themselves. It's and stunning. It's yeah. And, yeah. And going back to what I was saying to you uh, about why people like Catherine Hepburn and Laurence Olivier take an instant shine to you, uh, and a fantastic name, because you're you. 
and you go in there and, and that's what I love, you know, and, and be great. And this is that sort of a uh, wonderful personality and people like Derek Jarman. I mean, talk to me. We started off um, talking about Derek and how you went around to his house in Fragunta Road and how, talk to us about Jubilee and how effectively he became like your surrogate father, didn't he? Yeah, he was, he was a wonderful, wonderful human being. Um, it was very interesting because I've got to go back historically to that period in time. This was, I met him, I think, 77. Yeah. And an actor called Ian Charleston, who was starring in Charity. Charity of Fire. Remember yeah. that one? Um, he, we were at National Theatre together. I was doing Tales from the Vienna Woods. He was doing Val Pony. And um, he said, you've got to meet Derek Jarman. You, you're just going to hit it off. And he took me round to Tree Gunter Road uh, in yeah. South Kent. And the idea was I was going to have tea with Derek and just get to know him. And to put it into perspective then, I, I knew nothing about sex life. I, I, I knew about the birds and the bees, but I just knew nothing about the depth and the culture of people's sex lives. And I walked into the apartment and everyone was naked except Derek. And I just... I just didn't understand. And there was no women. I was the only woman in there. So anyway, we sit down and have tea. And at that time, Derek's partner was a very, very beautiful French boy called Eve. And Eve was just languid like a cat um, and was just wandering in and out, completely starkers, making tea for us and delivering biscuits and stuff. And Derek handed me a script, and I think it was called Down With The Queen. And he said, pick a roll. So I flicked through the script and I just picked the role with the most words. And he said, you can't have Amel, that's being played by um, an actress called Jordan, who was a muse of Malcolm McLaren and Vivian Westwood and worked in the seditionary shop. Yeah, I'm still in touch with Jordan, who's now a veteran nurse. Yes. Down in Brighton. Okay. Yeah, okay. And, you know, Derek was totally, totally in love with Jordan. Yeah. She, Jordan well, I think the whole of the punk world and the punk industry was in love with Jordan. She was iconic. Yeah. And another really interesting character because she was, she had such great normality about her, but she wore a very extreme sex clothes. And she would travel um, on the commuter train um, between Brighton and London with exposed breasts. Uh, she was strong. She was really strong. She took nothing from the middle class behavior that happened on those trains. So anyway, Jordan was starring in this film that was to be named Jubilee. And Derek gave me the role of Mad, which was the pyromaniac. And I thought, well, you know, this is my first movie. I feel I can really just be myself in this. And uh, about a month later, Derek tracked me down and he said, I, I've had to get rid of your character in the movie because we don't have the money to have as many characters. And Derek was an empath. And even though I, you know, I just, okay, thanks for letting me know, put the phone down. Derek realized he'd broken me in that moment because this was my lifesaver doing this film. And he spent another three weeks trying to track me down because I had no phone. I was in a, um, a bed sit and I used to phone him on a payphone on the street. And he tracked me down and he said, I put you back in the film. Um, we're doing it. I won't take a fee. My fee is going to pay for you to go back in this script. And it was a phenomenal experience of this very, very talented man who was honed in his craft in so many ways as a artist, a painter, a visual artist, a script writer, a filmmaker, a super eight filmmaker. He had so much to do and so much to say. And then on his private life, um, there were things going on that I couldn't even comprehend. Uh, and, you know, I occasionally would ask, like, Derek, what does this mean? Why is that That's person sort of doing that to the other person? Um, it's, you know, he was just magical, absolutely magical. What sort of things were going on in the private life? Just complete freedom, complete freedom. You, you talk about people wearing masks. Right. No one in Derek's life wore a mask. Right. Everyone was completely free to be instinctively what they felt they were. And I, coming from a very strict religious background and also a very strict upbringing anyway, where caning once a week was, was dished out just to make 
so we knew who was boss um, and a school that wouldn't identify with anyone that didn't fit into the norm it, Derek was a breath of fresh air but also I realized that I was a country girl coming into the town and, and I I ended up just keeping quiet because I was just showing my ignorance right. But, but it, wasn't, it was quite shocking, because I, I think you, you said publicly, I mean, that was the first time you'd seen other people naked, really, and, and, yeah. and, and that sort of stuff. So the shock of that, and then going to a movie like Jubilee, where, <laughs> where you're filming, that, that must have been a, a, bit, a bit challenging, wasn't it? Well, it was, because one of my first scenes um, was where I had to read one of Jordan's diaries, and Jordan was rewriting history in the movie. Yeah. And it was a 10 page scene on one shot. So we did the master shot first before we did the, the cutaways to Carl Johnson and um, Ian Charleston who were playing um, incestuous brothers. And it, it required me to kind of walk around this warehouse and then jump in, into bed with the brothers in between them. And I was in these huge rubber waders, a leotard and a life jacket. Uh, and three stone heavier with a shaved head. Uh, so, you know, not everyone's ideal of sexual attraction. And so we literally didn't do a run through. Derek said, just do what you want, but use the whole room. And when it got to going into the bed, I pulled back the kind of um, sheet and jumped into bed and I just completely froze. And Derek said, are you okay? Are you okay? Do you want a cue? And I said, oh, Derek, I've, I've not been with a naked man this close before. It's just, and they were both naked next to me. And like the whole floor just burst out laughing. And I said, can I just get used to it? <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it is close. And even when they did it a few years ago at the Lyric in Hammersmith, I know it's in Manchester yeah. as well. Oh, wonderful. I was fantastic. And seeing you, you were Queen Elizabeth in that when they, they did it as a stage play. Um, and there was still that shock element. I mean, you know, I was with a few, few celebrity friends and, and, yeah. and the first time I came to see it, they, it was quite tough for them, I think, on that sort of basis where there is yeah. still that shock, isn't there? And, and I was going to say, nowadays, it's still, having come from the punk era where you did, you could shock people still. Nowadays, it's quite difficult to shock people, isn't it? Well, this was an ad adaptation by the director, writer, Chris Goode who is renowned for shocking right and his writing i think was magnificent really magnificent and he wasn't held back by the restrictions and laws that derek was held back by all of his life um so chris good was able to write with the creative and sexual freedom we luckily have today and he decided to choose a gender fluid cast a very brilliant cast oh they were magnificent. Superb, superb cast. And you can Absolutely. tell they all got on well together. We love each other. We still love each other. Right. Um, and they were talented. So amazingly talented. Um, and breathtaking. And I had to kind of relearn things I thought I was cool about. Uh, we weren't allowed to use he or she or gender specifications. So everything became fluid. So when I said, come on, guys, let's go for lunch. It was like, oh, you know, you just had to learn they, it. I don't like calling people it because, you know, there, there are famous books about child abuse called it. Uh, so, you know, I had to learn the use of the English language that didn't offend this new generation. But the performance itself, it was shocking. And it was meant to be shocking. There was female nudity and continual male nudity and sex scenes between men, women, girl, girl, boy, boy. And they were going on with the audience intermingled on stage. Yeah. So I think the, the Lyric Hammersmith, it found its audience. What was interesting, we, we opened in Manchester at the Royal Exchange and we would lose 80% of the audience in the interval. And it was just too much for them. And, but well done for the Royal Exchange for being that yeah, brave absolutely. for doing it. But um, the Lyric, it was a really, really special, super special event. I know, I, I came to see it twice. Once with some, uh, as you know, some, some chums in the celebrity world. I uh, went along to that, was very good. And then came back on the final night. And you were superb in it because you were Queen Elizabeth in this one. What, what a great role. 
It is stunning. Uh, Jenny Ronacre was the original um, Queen Elizabeth in the Jubilee movie. Uh, but Chris Goode um, wanted to work with me and he initially brought me on board as an advisor to uh, teach the, the, the much younger cast, because I think most of them were below 30, about punk. And then he said, well, would you play Queen Elizabeth the first? And I, yeah. And it was a wonderful role to play because she was an anachronism. Yeah. We were able to kind of place her anywhere in time, even though I was wearing the crinoline and all of that, the makeup was modern and the attitude was modern. And when you look at Queen Elizabeth I, she really was a punk. When she came to the throne, England only had £336,000 in the coffers. It was broke. Yeah. It was broke through war, broke through many other things. So this woman was very, very clever. She I have to be careful here because of international relationships, but she robbed the Spanish to make English very wealthy. Uh, and she plundered. She plundered. She used others to do her murders for her. She, she was, I think, a coward in many ways because she wanted people done away with that she employed others to do the deed um, and then feigned tears over it. She, she was a remarkably interesting character, but you've got to remember her father was Henry VIII. Yes, well, quite. I think that would make anybody interesting, wouldn't it? <laughs> yes. And then you get alchemy. Yeah. You, you've got to tell me to shut up because this is my favourite period. Oh, no, I, I, I love it. I never tell you to shut up. I love it. Well, you see, John D. Yeah. I believe, like, um, uh, like many of the creatives in, in the history of mankind who've evolved, who, who've made us kind of um, become a step further in evolution, John D. was one of those people who was in her life. And John D. I think, outlived Queen Elizabeth. He got banished to Manchester. But he was an alchemist, but he was also a man that I feel that could see into the future, like Nostradamus, like Leonardo da Vinci. He, he had that, what I call, he had a finger plugged into morphic resonance. He could see beyond the present time. And it makes her very, very special, very special. Shakespeare could see beyond the present time. Uh, and of course, Shakespeare was around when Queen Elizabeth I was around. Absolutely. And, and, and beautiful segue, because I love this. We should always write the script for this, because the segue with the, your second Derek Jarman thing, uh, he then took you along for your sh first Shakespearean role, didn't he? Yes. Um, I, I was already ascending very fast as a film actress and as a singer. So I think by the time I was asked to do Miranda in The Tempest, I'd already done Quadrophenia yes. and I was breaking as a huge star, as a singer. Uh, and that was in the indie chart. The first ever indie chart, I was continuously number one for two years with whatever wow. I released. And in the albums chart, the nationwide album chart, I was continuously number two with whatever I released. But albums didn't draw a lot of publicity back then. So anyway, Derek asked me to uh, play Miranda in The Tempest and I was a bit nervous about it because I didn't like Shakespeare at school. I didn't get it. And he said he would personally get me through the role. And he said he wanted me hands on with the design of how Miranda should behave, how she should look. And I met with Yolanda Soliband, who was um, the designer for the Royal Ballet, I think at the time. And we came to this conclusion that this was a girl who was shipwrecked at the age of three, had never seen a man other than her father, had only had the company of Sycorax, who was a monster in human form, and only knew nature. So we created this creature with kind of um, little plaited pigtails right. and sun bleached hair and uh, a kind of skeletal crinoline with shells hanging off it and a broken down corset. And she was a wild child. Brilliant. I loved it. I know, and, and, and typecasting almost, you, you have to be that sort of wild child and that sort of principle. But, but you mentioned, I mean, going back, I mean, the, the Derek Jarman of today, what do you think he, I don't know, new sexual freedoms, that sort of stuff, what would he have become? I, th I think, and I often wish he was still here, because I think he'd have become an, an international director. The interest in his work 
now is huge. Yeah. And what was evident when we did Jubilee on stage was that a lot of young filmmakers were more interested in Derek Jarman's history as a Super 8 filmmaker than they were in the big blockbuster style of movies. Because Derek Jarman was a collage builder. He, he worked with color and texture which on film is a very exciting thing to do. And I think young filmmakers would get a lot from him today. So I, I wish he was still alive because he, he like Hockney, is, was someone I believe would have continued to thrill his audience. Yeah, and I, I think that's absolutely, and that's the sort of tragedy of it, isn't it? As you sort of see how they sort of paved the way. But what I love about it, he took you under his wind and he was, as you say, your surrogate father. He was a great friend, great friend. I, I was in poverty until I was about 23. Uh, so I, when with the band, I was only ever paid 30 pounds a week and we had to tour on that, go and make movies and all of that. So I was always in poverty. I, I never had money for food. Uh, I can remember going into fish, fish and chip shops at 11 o'clock and just being given the scraps to eat. Uh, so it, it was kind of a, a tough beginning but I don't think it's any different to the majority. Um, and Derek used to feed me and make sure I was okay. He was very in tune with mental health as well and would always kind of G me up if I was uh, not working at a particular time. And he, he would invite me along to meet some journalists or to meet other directors. He, he would plug me in so that I got some work like modeling for Vivian Westwood for the day, which which gave me a hundred quid. So he, he was he was a good man, good man. Yeah, and, and about that sort of time, and talking about Vivian Westwood and that whole sort of uh, beautiful segue into um, uh, the, the Sex Pistols and Malcolm McLaren and, and Quadrophenia, because Malcolm originally, he, he uh, uh, well, Johnny Rotten, I think, was originally going to be in Quadrophenia, wasn't he? Yeah. And I think well, what I... happens, that the story goes that the insurance uh, wouldn't, wouldn't allow it, basically, is that right? Yeah, I, I was asked to get John Lydon, um, yeah a.k.a. Johnny Rotten, through the screen test for Quadrophenia. Frank Rodham asked me if I'd do that. And I, I didn't really know Johnny Rotten at the time, but I went along to his apartment off the King's Road. Yeah. And it was interesting because there was a band called The Slits Unconscious on the floor, uh, uh, along with many others of the living room, was just like, a lot of people unconscious. You're used to this. You've been in Derek Jarman's house with all the naked men. This is the next stage up. Well, I, I tell you what's interesting about Derek Jarman. Everyone was active. You had John Matebury building sets. Right. And you had people building pictures and painting and doing animation and making movies. With Johnny, everyone was comatose. <laughs> um, so Johnny and I went into his kitchen. We ran two scenes. Obviously, Johnny was testing to play Jimmy and I was testing for Steph, the female lead. Um, neither of us got the job and what was interesting is Johnny was phenomenal. He, he, he was a very excellent actor. Really good. And I think um, Pete Townsend phoned Johnny to say, look, we love your acting, but you can't do the film. We can't get the money or the insurance if you're in it. Yeah. And I think Johnny Rotten said, well, I don't want to play you anyway. That sounds like Johnny. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's good. I, I hope he goes into acting because yeah. he's, you know, he's like Ray Winston. He's got that quality. Oh, no, he has. I mean, it's a great character. And the Sex Pistols were, were a great band. I mean, you, you saw them early on, didn't you? When you went when you came to London the first time. No, I saw them in Birmingham. Birmingham. Uh, when I, well, I felt very isolated with my green and yellow hair and my homemade clothes. Right. And I was at drama school and I, I was thinking, you know, why am I like this when everyone else is pretty and petite? Uh, a friend said, um, why don't you go along to a nightclub called Bogarts? There's a band on called the Sex Pistols. See what you think of them. And I went along and suddenly I wasn't the only punk in the village. There was 350 punks there and I'd found my place and my community and and that very much gave me confidence to be different and unusual yeah and, and i think it's, it's getting that sort of inspiration to, to, to make that make sense so so quadrophenia came came johnny didn't get the role for insurance or other reasons whatever happens um talk to me about the role because you, you met some extraordinary people in that as well didn't you 
Well, Quadrophenia is a, a stunning movie directed by Frank Rodden, who up to that point was known for making very gritty, brilliant documentaries. Yeah. And that's how he wanted to shoot Quadrophenia. So the cast, uh, iconic cast, uh, Phil Daniels, who quite rightly got the role of Jimmy and his performance is up there with every other A-lister performance that's Oscar winning. It, it's stunning. If you don't brilliant, know the brilliant, movie, brilliant. watch it for him. Um, Leslie Ash plays Steph, uh, Sting plays the ace, Mark Wingate, myself, Gary Shale, Trevor Lard, have I mentioned everyone in that row? I think I have. So if you look at the poster, it's an iconic poster of stars to be. And I played monkey in it. Well, I was making Corners Green with Catherine Hepburn um, when I realized that the production office of was in the same building and I hadn't got a part. So I started pestering Frank Rodden. I knew he hadn't cast Monkey because he didn't know how to cast Monkey yeah. and he'd not found the right person. So his office was ground level at Wembley um, at Lee Electrics. So I used to go out the building from filming with Catherine Hepburn, sometimes in costume, and bang on the window. I said, Frank, give me a job. And he called me in and he didn't know that I knew Phil Daniels, because I did my first ever acting role with Phil Daniels. I know, you can't I know. Go. I know. When I'm I was 18. First ever movie. And um, Frank Rodham said to me, well, if you can act the party scene from Quadrophenia where you snog Phil and you convince me you've got the role. Well, Phil and I just did the party scene and snogged and it wasn't a problem. Right. Um, so I got the role. And thank goodness, because it's probably the most famous film I've ever been in. Yeah, and, and for not, and you gain because being tired and being yourself, you, you hit it off. I mean, Sting, you, you, you hit it off with him, didn't you? You got him very well from the beginning. Sting was lovely. Sting, you know, school teacher. He knows how to deal with people. He knows how to uh, bring people out of themselves. Um, so the Sting spent a lot of time trying to teach me and another actress called Tammy how to sing the harmonies to police songs. And at that point, I, my ear wasn't trained enough to do harmony, um, but he, he persevered and his star was ascending and he was a lovely, lovely man. Yeah, and, and I think, again, he draws on his experience thing, songs like Don't Stand So Close to Me, talking about his time as a teacher and if, if, if you, yeah. and that sort of stuff and, and, and the difficulties, which nowadays people are facing the same sort of issues. You've got to be... Um, well, yeah, and, and the thing with Sting, I mean, life has changed radically in the last 30 years. You know, um, every breath you take, you know, it, it could be about a stalker, it could be about an admirer, you know, it, it's, and I, I've had this in my career, one of my first, my second single was called Tribal Look, yep. and the, the kind of imagery was um, inspired by the Maasai warriors, so culturally it's completely culturally inappropriate now. Oh, sorry, Tori, your, your sounds are funny, I'm very funny. Let's stop that there, there we go. Okay, okay and we're... Back. There you go. Very good. The alien suddenly invaded Toy. I know we've got about 10 minutes left today, but we'll, with that, well, hopefully we're going to be able to bring you back because I know how incredibly busy you are. Uh, and we're going to have to do your career in little chunks, I think, one for little morsels. Um, but we were just talking about Sting and how wonderfully uh, influential he was on your life as well. Tell us a bit more. <laughs> well, I, mean, I worked with him in Quadrophenia. Uh, we then saw him socially because Robert and I bought Cecil Beaton's house in Wiltshire, Reddish House, and Sting was at Lake House, um, which was not that far away from us. So uh, he, it, Sting always impresses me that he likes to bring people together. There's that famous story where he put Madonna and Guy Ritchie together over Sunday lunch, and it was an instant success. Um, so you know, Sting is very good with people. But one of the people we shared as a friend, and this is going to sound very bizarre, was Edward Heath. Uh, and Edward took a, a huge shining to me. Um, he agreed to let me interview him for a TV series I was doing in the Wiltshire area about uh, people who, who lived in Salisbury. And he, apparently he never allowed women to interview him. And we hit it off. And I ended up hosting his Sunday lunches with him at Arundel's, which Sting used to come to with Trudy as well. And there was one time when Sting, Trudy, Andrew Lloyd Webber, myself, 
a huge billionaire banker were all around the table. And I think Edward had to pop off and talk to Gaddafi for three hours on the phone. So it, there was other occasions where Princess Margaret was invited down. Yeah. And, you know, Ed, Ed, we were all we we're all kind of pushing away the responsibility of looking after Princess Margaret. So, I mean, Edward would go, you're, you're looking after her. You're looking after her. Go into the garden, look after her. So I go out to the garden. Hello, man. Hello, man. And I'd run back and like, we'd make Robert, Robert, you're looking after her. And, you know, we kind of all start hiding behind the bushes. And, but, but what I, and actually, Princess Margaret was somebody else who, who was, was lovely. I mean, she, because she was so down to earth. Well, unlike Princess Anne, very down to earth. Was really, really oh, wonderful woman. woman. A fantastic woman. And, and what I also got, Edward He, I, I work for a, um, a massive advertising agency called Dentsu. Did you ever see the movie Lost in Translation? Yes, I no, love it. Fantastic. It is all based on, on the advertising industry in Japan where you lit my stockings, all that sort of stuff. Oh, fantastic. So we used to get, as part of my role, to go and negotiate with major public figures and yeah. to get them to do advertising campaigns. So I did an Edward Heath campaign for Aqua Scutum. And so there's an advert with him doing Aqua Scutum. I got Stephen Hawking, uh, God rest his soul, I got him to do uh, Uniqlo. Um, we had Maggie Thatcher, and we got Geoffrey Archer for free, would come along to different things. And all these public figures and the A-list celebrities would come along to Japan. They work on the basis, yes, it's a lot of money. Secondly, yes. nobody's going to see it outside of Japan, so it's okay. But yes. Edward Heath was a wonderful character, so I can totally see how you're sort of hit that off on, on that sort of thing as well. One of the most human sides of Edward Heath I ever saw was his love for his family. Yeah. Nieces and all of that. And there was this moment um, in the cathedral where Edward was conducting um, a huge symphony orchestra and a guest pianist had come in from Europe. And I wish I could remember the name of the pianist, but this man had just lost his wife and he sat down at the grand piano and he, he collapsed in tears and, and he left the cathedral. And Edward, who you don't think of as an empath, just left the cathedral went and embraced the man and talked to him and got him back and it was the most electric performance this man came back and just everything he'd been through traveled through his fingers into that grand piano and it was very interesting seeing edward deal with such a human situation because we don't often see leaders and mps as as that human uh, and it, he he was very very capable of, of being tender. Yeah. And I, I, I think that's, that, if you like, the, for, for today is the secret of, uh, firstly, of, of your success. Firstly, because you are so real. I know you're incredibly busy and, uh, and do that sort of thing. But it's always Toya. And the great thing is it, it encourages others just to be themselves. And I, I love the phrase. It's Daniel Lismore, a great chum as well. Be yourself because everybody else is taken. And yes, I, I love that good. because if there's one message today, and we will get you back. Hopefully, when you're when you've got a minute in your busy schedule, uh, I can get you back and we can chat about more of the stuff. But, but I should let you go for today. It's been a, a real, real pleasure catching up with you. I'm sorry, we love the Robin and everything, and um, I, I look forward to chatting again soon when you get a moment. Well, it's good to see you, Andrew, and big love to you and your family, and hello to all your listeners. So I'll, I will see you soon. I look forward to it. Thanks a lot. Take care. Toy World Club. Thank you. Bye. <laughs> there you go. My wonderful chum, the lovely, lovely, lovely Toy World Cops, who we will get back here. Um, but thank you very much for watching. Uh, for all of those who want to take part, write to lol, that's L O L, at octopustv.com. Don't forget to subscribe for much more of the same. And if you'd like to be on the program or you have any views on any of the stuff we've discussed, put it in the comments below, but do be in touch. Uh, but for now, I thank you again to Toya. I've been Andrew Eborn. You've been great. And I'll see you next time. Bye bye.